Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. Um, can we just say, uh, let me just say from the outset how pleased I am that this is the first private member's motion brought to the floor of the Assembly since our return to this chamber. And what better message to send out to our constituents than one which shows that we prioritise those in need, that we champion better outcomes for all, and that we support our educators in bringing through future generations. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, even while the Assembly was down, the work of the All Party Group, for which I am proud to be Chair, continued. As many of you already know, the All Party Group on Autism was set up in 2008 to look specifically at issues relating to the autism community in Northern Ireland. The aim of the All Party Group is to ultimately ensure adequate support and services are available to the 30,000 families affected by autism and that the main issues relating to this are highlighted. The APG has seen the introduction of the Autism Act in 2011 and the resulting Autism Strategy, which Autism NI as Secretariat has led the lobby for, and we thank them for that. However, since the strategy was introduced, the APG in Autism has also seen the many failures of the strategy, which are outlined within the Broken Promises Report of 2016, and I would encourage you all to read. The Autism Act is still the most comprehensive piece of single disability legislation in Europe, but it has failed to accomplish what we as an APG hoped it would. We feel particularly let down by the resulting autism strategy and the action plans that have accompanied it. Only one out of the three action plans have been completed, with all three having a deadline of 2020. This stagnation of delivery is a legacy of three years without this place. And therefore, the onus is on us to correct this with swift and decisive action to make up for lost time. The reality is stark. Autism has nearly doubled in childhood diagnosis in the past six years. Therefore, the lack of support and services has become more and more evident. For example, diagnosis is supposed to be within an eight-week time period as outlined within the autism strategy. However, we know that in most areas this is not happening, with many families waiting up to 18 months. We all know early intervention is key in relation to managing autism, but intervention is being delayed due to the lengthy diagnosis process. Early intervention services are also inadequate. They vary from trust to trust and at present do not support the complex needs of our families and children. However, education is by far the issue raised by parents, by teachers' unions, and we know by many related cases we have within our own constituencies. The school environment is ultimately where autistic children spend the vast majority of their day. The Old Party Group has met with the Ulster Teachers Union on various occasions over the past two years, and they have unreservedly told us that they cannot access adequate autism training provision through the Department of Education. In fact, the current president, Susan Thompson, reported recently, and I quote, there are not enough courses, the timings of the courses are inaccessible, and the fact that they are not mandatory is worrying. Teachers and classroom assistants feel overwhelmed and under-resourced to be able to work with children with autism as they have not had the opportunity to gain the skills needed to do so. Therefore, the Ulster Teachers Union, alongside National Association of Teachers and National Education Union, have said unequivocally that they are in full support of mandatory autism training to be introduced into Northern Ireland, into Northern Ireland immediately. Autism NI has the only autism-specific helpline in Northern Ireland and receives over 5,000 calls each year from autistic individuals, parents and professionals, with the subject of education being the vast majority of those calls. The charity also conducted a survey in 2019, specifically in, in relation to education. And from this survey, it was discovered that over a third of children with autism were on a reduced timetable. This can mean reduced for just an hour a day, or it can mean in class for only an hour a day, and this is totally unacceptable. It is even more unacceptable when you take into account that 78% of autistic children are in mainstream classrooms, with currently one in 30 school-aged children being diagnosed with autism. This could be possibly one child in every classroom. For this reason, it should be seen as common sense that the person they are spending a large quantity of their day with understands them and is able to educate them and support them in a way that fulfills their needs. For parents already anxious about challenges their child faces each and every day, to have the reassurance of a fully trained teacher would provide additional comfort and support that their child will be supported in the best way possible because of mandatory training. 
I urge the Minister to act. The public support is widespread. An online petition in September 2019, which was created by the charity Autism NI, calling for mandatory autism training, was signed by more than 10,000 people within just a few days. An accompanying rally was also held at Stormont, attended by hundreds, and received good media coverage. We have a draft programme for government which clearly states that every child deserves the best start in life. The best start in life for any child would include the best educational outcomes. But for children with autism, we know that is not the case. Within the autism strategy, it also states that all teaching staff should understand autism. Again, we know this target has not been met. These are our children's lives that we are playing with and their future. Mr. President, Deputy Speaker, every autistic child becomes an autistic adult. We need to spend now to save later or risk many of our autistic adults ending up in mental health services, which we know are already under pressure. The UK's largest autism research charity, Autistica, recently reported that autistic adults are nine times more likely to die through suicide than the rest of the general population. I'm sure that you'll agree that this statistic is horrific and unacceptable. Autism training makes good economic sense. With the right support and opportunities, we know autistic young children can achieve and go on to live a fulfilling and productive life. Not only is it our moral duty to reverse the fate of a generation of children and young people with autism, but it makes good social and economic sense. The UK statistic for autistic adults in employment is 16% for full-time work. This figure has remained the same for the last decade, showing that autistic people are not benefiting and reaffirming that we must turn the curve earlier at every step of their journey towards adulthood and work. The NI executive has a responsibility to make sure that autistic children can get the support that they need at the earliest opportunity, and we know that's from education from people who understand autism. Autistic children deserve the same opportunities in life as their peers. We should all be wanting to create a more inclusive environment for all our children, and autistic children and adults need to be part of that. Other parts of the UK have already implemented mandatory autism training for teachers, and Northern Ireland needs to follow suit or risk being left behind. We're not asking for autism to be elevated above other disabilities or needs. We are simply asking for our children to have an equal playing field that can be afforded to the most basic right of a good education. A friend recently shared a post on Facebook that said the following, and I'm quoting again, allowing a student with a hidden disability to struggle academically or socially when all that is needed for success are appropriate accommodations and explicit instruction is no different than failing to provide a ramp for a person in a wheelchair. How true is that? Would any child with any other disability be asked to attend a school which is not equipped, resourced or trained to support their needs? No, they would not. Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, I think it's important that this debate focuses on what the motion asks for. It asks for mandatory autism training. What it does not include in this is the nature of that training, and that is for the department to consult on. What is important to, to Today, however, is that we get the commitment to introduce mandatory training, the form of which is for another day and will only serve to confuse the debate at this stage. Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, I am asking the Minister of Education to introduce mandatory autism training for all teaching staff, to include those in training, those already in post and classroom assistance in Northern Ireland. And I would also respectfully ask that any exp exploration period required be kept an absolute minimum because our children have waited long enough. Thank you. Thank you. I call Ms Rachel Woods to move amendment number one. Thank you. Mr Principal, Deputy Speaker, I beg to move the amendment. Thank you. The proposer of the amendment will have ten minutes to propose and five minutes to wind. I call Ms Woods to open the debate on amendment number one. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. Um, autism, as we know, is a lifelong disability which affects the social and communication centre of the brain. It affects the way an individual relates to people, situations, and their immediate environment. Many individuals with autism have difficulty processing everyday sensory information like sight, smells, touch, tastes, and sounds, and this varies from person to person. Many members in the chamber will know someone with autism 
Indeed, the number of children identified with autism has increased year on year since 2012 in Northern Ireland. According to the Department of Health figures published in 2019, one in 30 school-aged children have autism in Northern Ireland, and 78% of autistic children are in mainstream schools. That is potentially one in every classroom. Given this, and the inherent tendency in Northern Ireland of reactionary training for teachers, we should be pursuing a more proactive approach, and I believe that compulsory or mandatory training on autism would be a solid foundation to build upon. In 2012, the National Autistic Society for Northern Ireland carried out a survey of children with autism and their parents, and of the young people they spoke to, almost a third said that one of the worst things about school is that their teachers did not understand them. School is daunting enough, as we all know, for any child, let alone one that feels that they are not understood. This puts undue pressure and stress on the student themselves, the teacher and student relationship, the wider interaction in the classroom with others, and also between the teacher and the family relationship. More widely, it adds to mental health pressures. After speaking to a good friend of mine in Bangor called Aaron, and about his experiences in school and his experiences with tech, he told me that he would like to see mental health of children and young people that autism talked about, as they're often forgotten. And as per I will, yeah. Thank the member for giving way. And, and on the point of, of mental health, would she agree with me that one of the sad realities of a lack of autism training in schools is that many parents are being overwhelmed um, in relation to dealing with the spill out at home in relation to autism and how that has had been an adverse impact on their mental health? Thank the member for his question. I would completely agree. I think parents have enough pressure on them, uh, let alone when dealing with the situation where I say the teachers are not involved or understand what's going on at home. And I thank you for that. So Aaron had st stated that teachers, if the teachers were more aware of how to deal with pupils with autism and had mandatory training in their issues and their mental health would be better understood too. That research conducted in 2012 also showed that expertise in schools remained patchy and that many teachers did not get the training, the knowledge or the resources that they needed to help children with autism. Almost one in five parents indicated dissatisfaction with teachers' understanding of how to support children there. More recently, Autism NI stated that one third of parents coming to them for advice on their children's education said that they were on a reduced timetable at their current school. And I agree with the Chief Executive at Autism NI, Mr Deputy Speaker, that this is entirely unacceptable. Autism is categorised as a disability under the Disability Discrimination Act and under the Autism NI Act 2011, where reasonable adjustments must be made in all public organisations. But we know that this is not happening in many of our schools. All of our children should be given the best possible start in life, and a child with autism should not be disadvantaged when it comes to their education. So, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, I must ask, how, must, how, how can children with autism not be disadvantaged in their education if we continue, continue the current opt-in training culture? Adequate mandatory training for teachers would mean that special education needs of all children and young people, including those with autism, are met and would also be an important, important first step to help transform the lives and prospects of future generations of children with autism. The reason why mandatory training is so important and why we have tabled this amendment is to make sure that teachers, classroom assistants and are working towards a whole school approach in supporting children. It is of note that in September 2019, the government announced that all health and social care staff would be re receiving training in autism and learning disability in England, working towards a whole health care approach. And I would like to congratulate those who campaigned on this issue, specifically to MENCAP and their Treat Me Well campaign, and also to the all-party groups that would have been formed. I would hope that this can be fully realised in Northern Ireland too. So could this not be rolled out to our educators to better people's experiences in a school setting as well? Research conducted by the Ulster University in the Greater Belfast area in 2003 found that a majority of staff felt they had inadequate training to equip them to meet with children's particular needs and re report a lack of knowledge and skills to help those children. Teachers and classroom assistants are fully supportive of this motion. All of the teachers' unions in Northern Ireland are supportive to the introduction of mandatory autism training. And I note the Autism Strategy 2013 to 2020 and Action Plan 2013 to 16 support funding for autism-related training for those in the preschool sector is listed, as well as the publication of guides for teachers in classrooms and some school and parent resources. However, training should not be limited to those in the preschool sector only. 
and should be extended to all those training to be teachers, all those training to be classroom assistants and all those who are currently qualified. The initial teacher training programme in the rest of the UK covers a wide variety of these skills that teachers need to teach the curriculum. And in 2016, the UK government added a teacher training fra framework which ensures that SEN is covered, including how to support children with autism. We have, to, we, have time to ha we have had time to find ways in which we can improve provision of support for those who have autism in our schools, so the time for exploring options is now over. What we need now is concrete action for teachers and their students. This is not to say that we do not have any resources in Northern Ireland. We do. The Department invests substantial resources into training provision at Middleton Autism Centre, and while this is to be commended, it is not sufficient and does not meet the growing demand, nor is it compulsory. Providing support to schools, including the continuing professional development of staff, has already been identified in previous strategies and action plans. And we in Assembly should be pushing on with this by compelling the Minister for Education to include autism training as part of the core teacher training. Previous Assembly questions to the Minister have already shown that it is not possible to know how many teachers have actually received the current training. But with mandatory training, we know that we can and will ensure that everyone has received the same level. In September last year, a petition was signed by over 10,000 people online asking the Department of Education to introduce mandatory training. A rally attended by people with autism, parents, teachers was held here on September 11, 2019, making their voices heard. We have much to do here to strengthen the Autism Act and ensure its proper implementation. But Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, I think we should be listening to those 10,000 people here today. And that's why we're calling on the Minister to introduce mandatory autism, autism training as an important step in delivering for our young people and supporting our teaching staff. Thank you. Thank, thank you. I call Ms Karen Mullen to move Amendment No. 2. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, I'm speaking in support of the motion um, and in um, favour... The member has to beg to move first and then resume your seat. Sorry. I beg to move. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, the proposer of the amendment will have 10 minutes to propose and five minutes to wind. All other speakers will have five minutes. The Assembly should note that Amendment No. 1 and Amendment No. 2 are mutually exclusive. So, if Amendment 1 is made, the question shall not be put on Amendment No. 2. I call Mrs Karen Mullen. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, I'm speaking in favour of the motion um, and uh, also speaking in favour of Amendment, amendment 1. Um, I believe that our amendment strengthened the motion, but I believe that we should be showing a united front here today. Um, as a party's education spokesperson and member of the All Party Group, member of the all-party group on autism, I have heard from many in the education sector, parents, young people and the wider community who are calling for greater autism awareness and training. The UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities recognises the right to inclusive education for all persons with disabilities. If we are to go about realising this, then making autism-specific training mandatory for our teachers as a step in the right direction. In the North, one in 30 children have a diagnosis of autism. The vast majority of these children are educated in a mainstream setting. This shows the need for autism training for teachers and classroom assistants. In my own city, Derry City and Strabane District Council and our two main shopping centres have led the way in making our public venues inclusive for all and part of that has been training all frontline staff in autism awareness. If we can do that in our public and private sector, then why are we not providing that training to our teaching staff who have our children in their care anywhere up to 30 hours per week? Our teaching staff want to be supported to provide the best care and education to our young people and to be more equipped to do so. The role of the teacher is evolving. They are increasingly working with children with complex needs and introducing this training at the start of their journey will no doubt serve them well throughout their careers. For that reason, our amendment had moved to strengthen the motion to include a compulsory module during teacher training. Introducing this, teacher tra this in teacher training colleges is a very pragmatic step that could be taken which would have an impact for a relatively low cost. 
In October last year, I had met with the department and asked them to look at options including costs. One such option to be explored is assigning one of the allocated teacher training days, which would reduce teacher costs or costs of teacher cover. Widening out the training to include compulsory disability training should also be included. Today's motion and debate is the start of what is required. We need action. We now need action. Parents and young people need action, our and our teaching staff need action from all of us. The Autism Act was brought in 2011, and yet we continue to see an increased number of particularly children and young people waiting years on diagnosis and support services. I call on the Minister to acknowledge the crisis within special education needs provision and acknowledge that many teachers are actively seeking this training. Members, by supporting this motion and Amendment 1, we would send a positive message to the sector as well as families. Thank you. I thank the member. Um, we now move on to the list. Before I call the next speaker, I remind members that contributions are limited to five minutes, although if you take an intervention, you will get uh, an additional minute added. I call Mr Colin McGrath. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and I'm pl uh, pleased to speak today in support of this motion um, and also to the amendments, which we don't really see a major difference between, but we're, we're happy to support as we go along. Um, as members will know, the SDLP has campaigned for many years uh, for increased autism support from 2002 with John Fee, MLA, and eventually culminating in the Autism Act NI, which Dominic Bradley uh, brought uh, forward in 2010 and began operation in 2011. Sadly, the potential of that act to transform people's lives has been compromised not only by a lack of financial support, uh, but also by a lack of ministerial decision making over the past three years. And therefore, with that in mind, I would warmly welcome the fact that today we are in this chamber discussing this issue. Members, the need for this type of training is long overdue. The huge increase and rise in ASD-related diagnosis in recent years should serve as a wake-up call to the urgent need for this provision. We in this House, and indeed the Minister, must listen to the will of people here. And diagnoses have trebled in a decade Schools and autism services are struggling to meet an ever-increasing demand. And speaking with teachers and parents within my own constituency of South Down, there is a clear want and need for mandatory autism training within our schools. Yep, sure. Thank you. I appreciate you giving way. I stand not just as your South Down colleague who has heard that message resonating, but would the member agree with me that this critical training um, is the first and the right step. But unless it's properly resourced, and I take the point in not getting into the detail today, but unless it's properly resourced and takes real cognizance of the conflicting time pressures of the teacher in the classroom, and I say that as somebody who has come through teacher training, but the pressures in the classroom uh, can put a very different slant on it, and I would urge going forward that that is recognised. Thank you. The member has an additional minute. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, yes, certainly, and I think the resources are required whenever we look at the scale and the numbers uh, of young people. And some of the statistics that I will mention later in my remarks will uh, certainly highlight how they are go there's going to be need some form uh, of resource that goes alongside it. I mean, um, one eighth of the annual education budget, which is about I think 270 million pounds is currently being spent on supporting children with special education needs, including uh, autism. But I do think that we can do more. Um, the Department of Health tells us that one in 30 school-aged children live with ASD uh, and that 78 per cent of those children are in mainstream schools. That is a huge amount of numbers of young people uh, right across the north that are in all uh, types of schools that are having to deal with the issue. According to the Children's Law Centre, the number of parents experiencing difficulties in receiving support for their children has increased. There are teachers and classroom assistants that, through no fault of their own, do not understand the complexities of autism. That is leading to children who need targeted support, at times being given detention, at times being excluded from class, or ultimately being expelled from school. And we can't allow that to continue. As well, the Children's Law Centre said 
that um, compared to five years ago, they were dealing with 400 cases relating to special education within schools. That is now 1,600. So there is a very obvious need that we need to be addressing. The vast majority of staff, teachers, classroom assistants and support staff who work in our schools are among the most caring and considerate individuals in the North. Like many other roles, such as nursing, they do this um, with a sense of passion uh, beyond their sense of duty. Teachers and classroom assistants that my colleagues and I have listened to fully support the motion that is here today, and all of the teacher unions, as have been mentioned, also support but we have to make sure that this isn't simply a box-ticking exercise, and there is some concern among some that that's what this could become if it is just a quick half-day exercise. We need to make sure that it's done properly. But at the same time, we need to do something. I, I've always remembered the story of the end of class, whenever the bell rings, there's so much noise within the classroom that if a homework was issued at that stage, it could result in a child with autism not being able to process the instruction that they're given could lead later to them going home and having some uh, potential meltdown, and this can cause an awful lot of stress within the home as well. Teachers being equipped with very small uh, tips like that could help the classroom massively, especially for those 78% that are within mainstream. So it may, uh, if it is a half-day exercise, it may be very quick, but it could equip our teachers and classroom assistants with some real helpful insights to be able to help children. So, fellow members, it has been said that living with autism is simply a different way of experiencing the world. A person living with autism may see, hear, feel, taste and touch the full vibrancy of the world around them, and this is witnessed most keenly in the classroom. Uh, while it is a different way of experiencing the world, it can also be overwhelming. We must be sensitive to the needs of those living with autism and ensure that we have done all that we can to facilitate a sensitive understanding an informed learning environment and I urge each of you to support the motion. Thank you Mr Speaker. Thank you. I call Mr Robbie Butler. Thank you Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. I rise in support of the motion and the amendment and as a member of the APG on autism over perhaps this last four years I have become ever more increasingly aware of the disadvantage faced by our young people with autism. We know that in Northern Ireland we face higher levels of autism than the national average. In fact, the Department of Health figures in 2019 state that we now have one in 30 school-aged children with autism. And when we look at the average classroom size, this means that just about every classroom in Northern Ireland will have at least one child who may require adjustment or support. The timeline for action stretches back more than 10 years. In fact, and in 2009, Minister Majimsi published the ASD Strategic Action Plan, and later he commissioned the Regional Autism Spectrum Disorder Network to implement that strategy. This should have provided the momentum required to get us further than where we are today. Further ministerial announcements followed, and progress has been made. However, much momentum has been lost, and proper collegiate cross-departmental strategy perhaps has been lacking. My constituency office, as I am sure with the other members, handle a multiplicity of issues and children with autism and spectrum, uh, other spectrum issues figure highly on that list. And when, as an elected representative, I seek to help, I share the frustrations of parents, of carers, at the speed of response and at times the utter exasperation of teachers who are clearly seeking to do the best that they can do for their pupils. I'm delighted that the Ulster Teachers Union are supportive of the introduction of mandatory training. And in conversation with teacher friends, I'm convinced that this is the only way forward. The pressures faced by teachers are many, but surely an element of awareness training, raising the profession in a mandated form, accessed at initial training, and revisited through refresher events can only help alleviate the growing pressures. The majority of our children with autism are taught in mainstream education, in fact 78% to be accurate. Therefore, to try and dilute who is trained and where they are trained would be to ignore the struggle of our children in the education system across all of our communities. 
Every child deserves the best start in life. This comes from our programme for government. That being a collective aim of this, this executive means that we need a collegiate approach. That is to ensure our children are not disadvantaged in any way. Therefore, if we are to be serious about achieving this aim, we must ensure that all teaching and assistant staff are equipped and informed to help them fulfil their role. To do less would to be lower the bar to such an extent that we may fail before we even begin. It was incredible, and it has been mentioned by some members, to be part of the elected group which was in attendance when a petition of over 10,000 signatures was delivered to Stormont in September 2019. The rally was attended by parents, teachers, activists, and most importantly, autistic individuals. And it was a testament of the public body of support to see this motion become a reality. This is a very important point that I will finish on, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. The future of those individual children with autism will hinge on the support they get in the early and formative years. This is a partnership between parents, society, teachers and other agencies. However, when we reflect on the outcomes in future life and the barriers to work and further education, we must affect change and we must do it now. I support the motion as amended. Thank you. I call Ms Paula Bradshaw. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. I rise to support the motion and the amendment number one. As the Alliance Party health spokesperson since 2016, barely a day has passed that autism and the needs of the children living with it has not been raised with me. So this is good news. There is certainly a higher level of consciousness in the public of the condition and the steps that are needed to be taken forward. In my own constituency in November, I attended the opening of the new National Autism Society Centre in Carrydoff, and I know there are MLAs in the chamber here today who were also there. It is the first of its kind in Northern Ireland, designed specifically with the needs of people living with autism in mind. The advantage of having such a step forward is not only that it provides space for people with a condition and their carers, but it plays a role in further enhancing the awareness raising process to try to ensure people with autism are better better catered for in daily life generally, not least when accessing public services. We are in fact approaching a decade since the Autism Act, which does require reasonable adjustments to be made in public organisations. Unfortunately, that this has not happened across the school estate, given the various difficulties there have been in managing that efficiently. It is worth emphasising, however, that that Act and other legislation clearly requires equal treatment for children with autism in the education system. The last programme for government, as, as my colleague here has just pointed out, also gave a specific commitment to giving every child the best start in life. The motion correctly reflects that the need to achieve the outcome envisaged in the legislation is to make sure that everyone is aware of it and suitably trained. We are keen to strengthen it a little to emphasise that this is something that mu sorry, which must be done rather than just explored. And I do support Ms Cameron's um, recommendation there that this should be consulted upon because it is both our legal and moral duty. Furthermore, there is no issue from teachers themselves, and as we've heard today, the teacher union, unions are very much in favour of mandatory autism training. We are also keen to emphasise that this needs to include trainee teachers, as it needs to be there from the start of their education journey. New teachers entering the profession will have the advantage of growing up in a society which has already been more aware of autism than ever before and would no doubt be the first to say that specific training would be very useful. The reason, of course, that all teachers need to be trained is that all teachers will come across autism. On average, almost every class will have one child living with it and it is, of course, the vast majority of children with autism who are in our mainstream education provision. The most compelling reason is, of course, not to do with teachers or legal obligations, but it is due with the simple reality that so many people living with autism do not end up in full-time employment, something which must be, at least in part, to do with inadequate support from the start of their education, as well as to do with the ongoing lack of awareness of, of the condition, 
despite recent advances. Sorry. By enabling people with autism more choice and control at the outset, including of educational pathways and healthier life lifestyles, we can set them on the road to a more independent life with the same opportunities in learning and employment as everyone else. No one here today is arguing that this first step will solve all the problems around autism. We need to investigate better mental health provision, better workplace support and ongoing better public awareness, not just of autism, but the effects it has on people's lives. However, this is one step that would be hugely significant, not just because it has that impact on early life, but because it will send a very clear message from this Assembly that we want people living with autism to have exactly the same chances as everyone else. I commend the motion and uh, Amendment 1. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Paula Bradley. Uh, thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, and I welcome the opportunity today um, to speak on this very important issue. Can I thank my colleague, Pam Cameron, for bringing this motion to the House, but I also want to thank uh, the other members who have brought forward the amendments. I do believe that it goes some way um, to strengthening the motion, so it is very welcome, um, and uh, I will be supporting that in whatever way that falls. Um, as other members have said here, I have been an active member also um, of the All Party Group on Autism over the, the past number of years. And I know certainly within the, the time period of the three years when we didn't have an assembly, the All Party Group on Autism um, uh, was extremely active in calling all of the departments to account, in writing to those departments and asking just what they were doing to support not only children, but adult, adults also living with autism. And it became very apparent very early on that all departments were not, uh, 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 were, uh, they were falling short of what they were required to do under the Autism Act and under the Autism Strategy. But of course, we, we, we as MLAs cannot just uh, blame those departments for falling short. We have to take some of that blame ourselves, um, especially over, over the past three years where we maybe haven't been here to call those departments to account. So I am so glad we're back here. We're back here doing the job that we, we need to do. This motion is our first motion to the House. And we're saying that we make a commitment here today not to take our foot off the pedal, but to call all of those departments um, into account. Now, going back to the motion and, and the, the, around mandatory uh, training for teachers, I, uh, uh, Mrs Cameron had mentioned it in her speech, as maybe some others did, that whenever we had the National Union of Teachers in um, giving us an evidence session um, to the all-party group, it became very evident that uh, we were failing our children and our schools and they were crying out for the help. In some of our primary schools across Northern Ireland, there is maybe only one teacher in that primary school that is trained in mandatory autism training. Um, so therefore, I think the, the, the minister, it's incumbent on him to bring about that change in order that we deliver for those, ch those vulnerable children that need our help. It was interesting when we, uh, we got the information packs and the research packs to look back at the amount of assembly questions that have been put in over the last 10 years on mandatory autism training. There have been many, many, and it keeps coming back with the same answer. And one of the, the points in that answer is, is Middletown. I've also been there, along with some of uh, my all-party colleagues here. We took a trip uh, to Middletown, Pam and I had a bit of a road trip that day because I got us lost because I was directing. But we found it eventually. And it is a fantastic place. It is a wonderful place. They do wonderful, wonderful work, but it's not the answer. The answer is wider than that. The answer is to invest in all of our teachers um, that they get the help and the support that they need. I also want to praise here today the voluntary and the commun voluntary community sector um, and the work that they do in, in meeting, I suppose, that unmet need that we have out there, but also all of those parent-led groups that are uh, around there in our communities, and we all have them, and we've all visited them as constituency MLAs who are supporting one another, parents supporting one another to try to navigate through the education system and the health system as well, and sometimes that is the only help that they have. Um, I have to say also as a constituency MLA, um, like other colleagues around this table, special edu educational needs is something that comes up in our offices time and time again. I have had many meetings over the years with children specifically around autism um, who are not receiving uh, the, the proper uh, attention that they need. 
So I think this is something that we need to add on to the mandatory autism training. I think Mrs. the other Mrs. Bradley had mentioned it in her in her intervention that if we do have this and we do have mandatory training, once a child is diagnosed, those services need to follow the child. There's no point having a diagnosis only to find out that the services aren't available. Um, I have been around recently visiting some of the schools in my area, and there's a reoccurring theme, and that reoccurring theme is special educational needs and the services. It's all well and good having a diagnosis, but unless we have the support for those children and for those families, we're, we're not doing what we're set out to do. Yes. Thank you. Um, I love your passion for the, the, the subject. Um, just on that, uh, we know that uh, mental health exists in a, across uh, the suite of primary education and with the young people, but there's an even a greater propensity of mental health issues uh, with people, with our young people with autism. Um, to, would you agree with me that perhaps there is a double win here if we can support our young people in their um, in their journey with autism and also the, the hidden, perhaps at times, mental health issue that also exists and sometimes isn't recognised. Thank the member for his intervention. Member will have. Member will have an additional minute. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. And I was going to ask or say to him, thank you for that extra minute, but he nearly spoke the whole way through it. No, I, I absolutely, I absolutely agree with the member, and I think it's something that the, the chair of the all-party group brought up as well. You know, early intervention. We know in mental health, early intervention is key, and especially with children who have additional needs, that early intervention can can save money in the long term but of course we're not all about saving money we're about saving lives as well and quality of life so absolutely uh, a very good point i know I have very little time left here now but i just want to say you know uh, we within the schools in my area and one of them is cedar lodge which is for children with uh, with extra needs and additional needs especially around autism we need to be doing more to support um, those special educational schools as well. It doesn't just stop at the door of our, of our mainstream schools. So thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. Thank you. The next speaker I have is Mr Cahill Boylan. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. And I also welcome the opportunity to speak on this debate. I mean, I've been around the APG group now for since 2008. And I'm delighted that the Minister's here because I hope but after this debate, I'm going, I'll stick to the mandatory training, but I hope that the, the Minister will take the lead in all this, because a lot of us know that arising from the 2011 Act, there was a strategy and a plan, and that identified the responsibilities of each department. And I'm not going to, the, the previous member mentioned it, we would hope that the Minister will take the lead in this and show the other departments the way, because for a number of years, we've been trying to get the right services for the people in the ASD. And I want to put on record also my thanks to the Autism NI and also the um, there's another group, sorry, the National Autistic Society Plus, all of those people who have helped for a number of years in administrating the work of the group, the APG, because there's a lot of good work has gone into it. And for years, we put they have helped us compose a number of questions. And unfortunately, some days we get the right answers, but more often than not, I don't think we've made enough progress. But I think, listening to the comments of many of the contributors today, I think we're going in the right direction. And I want to thank all those people who. But there's two reports, uh, Mr. Speaker, that I do want to put on record, because I think it's important for these people who have helped us a lot and bring us to where we are today. And hopefully, after this, like I say, the Minister. We'll take on board the comments of the group and, and we can move forward uh, with the chair and, and all those people associated with the group and also work with the departments. And the issue of mandatory training actually goes back to a report that was done in the Long Gallery in 2012, which is A for Autism, Make Every School a Good School. That report highlighted the difficulties that children with autism were experiencing in the education system here. Education, as we know, is a fundamental part of every child's life. It gives children the opportunity to learn about the world they live in and how they can play a part in this world. It should be a time when children feel safe and happy, confident about building relationships and friendships and being able to make the most of their abilities and talents. It should help them to develop independence and prepare them for a bright and happy future. In the research for the report, Parents told us they wanted an education system that is ambitious and believes their children can achieve, that gives their children similar opportunities.
to other children, that understands and supports their children's needs, that allows their children to develop friendships and life skills, that allows their children to enjoy good mental health, and that prepares their children for life. These are what any parent would want for the child with or without autism. But unfortunately, I feel collectively as a group we have let them down. In 2016, the National Autistic Society NA, in conjunction with Autism NA, published Broken Promises, a report that highlighted the failures in terms of the delivery of the autism strategy itself going back to 2011, the difficulties that children and young people were experiencing in the education system, and a call was made for mandatory autism training for teachers and classroom assistants. Given that every teacher, and this is no slight on teachers, so I don't want them emailing me back in relation to that, but given every teacher will teach multiple autistic children during their careers, this puts these children at risk of being taught by teachers who have not chosen to educate themselves in their own time, and it's not a slight on them. If mandatory training were introduced, the quality of training would be fundamental. It is not enough to simply raise awareness of autism. Teachers must also understand autism and to be schooled in the techniques and strategies needed to teach a child with autism and all its associated complexities. Mandatory training would be a first step towards addressing and meeting the needs of the pupils with autism. We're not going to definitely divide today on this because I think everybody spoke very well. Of it. I am supporting the motion and the amendment, and I will reiterate again, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, that I hope the Minister will take the lead in this and ask for support right across the, di the different departments that have a role and responsibility right across the autism spectrum. Thank you. I call Mr. Gary Middleton. Uh, thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. And can I uh, begin by thanking my uh, colleagues for bringing this uh, very important motion forward? And I think the fact that uh, it's brought forward at such an early opportunity uh, really does send a signal as to how important this issue is, uh, not only to ourselves, uh, but indeed to, to wider society as well. And can I thank the Minister uh, for being here in the Chamber today, uh, and we hope that he will take on board some of the very valid points uh, that have been made by all uh, contributors uh, so far. Uh, I also want to pay tribute to uh, Autism NI, uh, the National Autistic Society, and all of the fantastic organisations who, uh, over this past uh, number of years, particularly this past three years, have kept their shoulders to the wheel. Uh, the the all-party group on autism has been mentioned, and the fact that they have continued to meet, uh, that is very valuable and important work, and, and hopefully that will um, pay dividends in terms of uh, what we're going to see over the next uh, coming weeks. Uh, within my own constituency, uh, like my colleague, I do want to recognise the, the uh, Circle of Support organisation and the many uh, parent-led organisations who um, do fantastic work voluntarily, but, but that support that they provide uh, between themselves is, is very, very important. Uh, there is no doubt that there is widespread support uh, for this motion. We know that uh, just last September uh, there was a rally held here at Stormont. We know that there was an online petition uh, with over 10,000 signatories. Uh, this is a hugely emotive issue and it is something that uh, we as elected members need to ensure that it is delivered upon. The Minister needs to ensure that it is delivered upon. Um, uh, and I am hopeful that that is going to happen over the next uh, number of weeks and months. Again, uh, as colleagues have mentioned, the teachers and classroom assistants have too indicated uh, their support for this motion, and uh, all of the teachers' unions here in Northern Ireland are supporting the introduction of mandatory autism training. Many of us in this chamber, including myself, have family members uh, with autism, uh, and we know that the various challenges, but also opportunities that that does bring, whether that be uh, at the initial assessment stage, through education, or indeed as they move into the workplace. Uh, and as my colleagues as well have already said, uh, we know of the delays around assessment, but when that assessment does come, uh, it is vital that the services follow that, uh, and that the services follow right through education and into the workplace as well. According to recent Department of Health figures, one in 30 school-aged children have autism in Northern Ireland. 
78% of those uh, autistic children are in mainstream schools, not special schools. Given these figures, I think it is vitally important that the teaching force here in Northern Ireland are receiving current and relevant and up-to-date training to assist them in delivering a curriculum that allows every child to reach their full potential. I think, uh, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, it is vital that no child is left behind. Only 16% of autistic adults are in full-time employment in the, in the UK, even though 78% do not have a learning disability. Many of those would say that uh, this is an adverse effect of the, the lack of support during the school years and not receiving a full education and mental health uh, deteriorating uh, as a result. So this gap does need to be filled. Uh, I have met with uh, individuals with autism uh, who now work in the public sector uh, over this past couple of years and some of them in very exciting roles. Uh, we need to ensure that we can, we can encourage people uh, with autism to get into, into the workplaces and that people are mindful and understanding of the particular uh, requirements and needs that they have. So, Mr. Speaker, uh, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, in closing, I just want to urge people to uh, get behind uh, the motion and indeed the amendments uh, in whatever way that, that falls. Thank you, Principal, Deputy Speaker. Thank you. I call Mr. Mark H. Durkin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. Uh, the introduction of mandatory autism training for all teaching staff was the subject of a petition that many members have mentioned here already today, uh, organised by Autism NI last year. Now, we saw the obvious, in my opinion, uh, need for such training and supported the petition. I'm sure others in here did. We were all, well, I was one of over 10,000 people who signed it. And I'd like to take this opportunity, like uh, Gary has, to commend Autism NI for the work that they have done on a continuous basis and consistent basis, campaigning to improve services and support for those living with autism. I must say, however, I was dumbfounded at the response uh, from the Department of Education to that petition when it was deemed that this proposal to increase provision in schools in line with a significant rise in autism diagnosis was premature. On the contrary, the need for this type of training, in our opinion, is long overdue. The exponential rise in autism and ASD-related diagnoses in recent years is testament to the urgent need for this provision. And speaking with teachers and parents, as others have, within and beyond my own constituency, there is a clear demand and desire for mandatory autism training. The Minister must listen where his department would not to the public and to the evidence here. Diagnoses, as Colin McGrath tells us, have trebled in the last decade, and autism services are struggling to meet that ever-increasing demand. I would contend, indeed, that it was the Department's response that was premature, made without giving due consideration to the inarguable statistics relating to the severe lack of adequate autism services within education. When it comes to autism, it seems we need to foster a change of attitudes, not among the general public, but among the powers that be. This issue needs to be progressed, and I welcome this motion as a means of doing so. And when it comes to education, no child should be left behind. We must create an education system that provides fair and equal access for all. Previous speakers have lamented the failure so far to deliver on the promises and potential of our Autism Act. But we can't just blame that on the fact that we haven't been here in three years. Long before that, pressure on autism services and lack of autism support was becoming unbearable, and the cracks that were showing are now growing. In my own constituency, there was uproar and outrage last year when I uncovered the fact that the Western Health and Social Care Trust was unable to use its allocation of funding for the Autism Pathway Project and that money was sent back despite the fact that we had in that trust area over 800 people waiting on a list for assessment. This befuddled many 
particularly those working hard in the community to support individuals and families with autism. And we're lucky to have several of those organisations uh, in, in Derry. Gary Middleton mentioned Circle of Support. Paca and Jigsaw are another couple that do sterling work. But I, and I was very glad last week to have it confirmed to me by the Western Trust that significant steps have been taken and are being taken to address uh, the, their huge shortcomings that have existed in this area. There is a, dan a danger, because the demand for diagnosis has become so huge, that diagnosis and meeting that demand becomes our sole focus or our holy grail. Paula Bradley mentioned that, that many families discovered to their disappointment and confusion that once they have won their battle, or in many cases war, for diagnosis, that they are left in limbo. There are inconsistencies across trust areas. We need to ascertain what works best where and try to replicate that across the board. We also have to be mindful that it is not only in schools where uh, support is required and where hugely positive interventions can be made. We need to look at support at home that can, can be given to families, especially in those early days after diagnosis, and how we can help families prepare, adjust and cope better themselves. And just to conclude, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, we certainly uh, support the motion. We would also support uh, Amendment 1. But I would say, in terms of how the training should look, that it should have input from individuals living with autism, both in design and delivery. And it is also worth highlighting that the better that our staff and schools are able to cope with autism, the better for all pupils in our schools. Thank you. I call Mr George Robinson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. First and foremost, I, I want to thank my colleagues for bringing this very important motion to this chamber and indeed the amendments. <clears throat> and I'm sure all M MLAs in this chamber recognise the challenges that come with autism. Therefore, it is essential that all staff working with autistic children realise that they are appreciated and valued by this assembly. <clears throat> Looking through the 2011 Autism Act Northern Ireland, I have been struck by the interdepartmental working required to ensure that people with autism have the best possible services. One department specifically named in the 2011 Act is education. I believe this is entirely correct. <clears throat> Teachers have a challenging role, but when a child with autism is in the class, there is an additional level of expertise required to ensure a good level of education for that pupil. It is therefore eminently sensible that teachers are given the tools required to achieve the best education possible for the specific pu pupil. Regardless, regardless of what disabilities or problems a pu pupil has, they all deserve to attain their maximum possible potential in an educational setting. Ensuring teachers and classroom assistants are given the correct training is a step in achieving this. All of us are aware of the challenges local education in general faces, but I would ask the Minister to <clears throat> explore the introduction of mandatory autism training to ensure best possible educational outcomes for all pupils, even those on reduced timetables. One parent has told me that an entire class will benefit from such an approach as the training aids the staff to deal in a proactive way with autistic pupils and minimises the time required to, de to deal with a specific pupil. All pupils will therefore benefit from teachers receiving training re regardless. I do appreciate, Minister, that budgets are very tight within your department. However, I do believe that some investment in this aspect of teacher training will provide tangible and very worthwhile benefits for those children with autism. Mr Speaker, I support the motion. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker I have listed is Mr. Jerry Carroll. Mr. Speaker, um, and I put out word of my constituents uh, about this topic. And since um, since that, I've been overwhelmed by messages and emails. I'm sure other members are the same, uh, and responses from people with autism, parents, teachers, and classroom assistants as well. And indeed, it's fair to say that if, uh, since I've been elected to this um, chamber since uh, 2016, almost four years ago, um, it's been an issue that I've been inundated with uh, since then. 
I think it's very clear, Mr. Speaker, that our current system is not working for too many people with autism and many with other learning disabilities. Education workers who have been in the field for years tell of a dire situation within our education system where fundamental problems see children left uh, under-supported. Uh, too many are unable to get statemented. Too many are left in September, uh, Mr. Speaker, without a school. Uh, or without an offer of a school because of their statement. Too many do not get the proper educational support, even when they have been uh, statemented. And all of those feelings can have serious impacts going forward. We see people with autism experiencing uh, mental health problems because of a lack of support uh, services. And we see children underachieving educationally because of a lack uh, of provision. Uh, and we have working class families as well, Mr Speaker, who are forced to pay privately uh, to get their children diagnosed with autism. None of this is good enough and is totally unacceptable. Um, and none of this, Mr. Speaker, touches on the impact of underprovision and the misrepresentation outside of school time, like the fact that people have to fundraise to pay uh, for respite or even just basic uh, facilities and services, or the fact that negative and harmful stereotypes of people with autism is still per perpetuated in society. Uh, disgracefully, autism was used uh, last week by uh, a Fine Gael member, uh, elected member, as a slur uh, on, uh, on somebody else in the general election campaigns uh, in the South. And too often, uh, Greta Thunberg, uh, the term is used as an attempt to uh, delegitimise de her campaign and as a slur against her. And people with autism deserve much better than this, but unfortunately, on these issues, they are being uh, failed. So we absolutely uh, endorse uh, training and education as an essential criteria for supporting people with autism. But we also know, Mr. Speaker, that much more must be done on top of that. Uh, to slash waiting times, uh, to address the wider issues like underinvestment in education, generally bigger class sizes, a lack of access to class, classroom assistance, to name but a few of those issues. And we are clear that whatever mandatory training is put in place, it is not a tick box exercise, uh, but wide-reaching and encompassing of all the research that has been found to support children with autism, which is adaptive to react to the different levels and types of support that different pupils with different uh, needs require, to ensure that the development of this training programme should have the input Mr. Speaker, of people with autism and teachers and classroom assistants who are across the current failings in the system, who know that because of educational attainment or gender, some children can be overlooked or, or dismissed uh, and dismissed as acting out. So we absolutely uh, must ensure that our teachers and our classroom assistants, uh, who do the utmost to support their classes and their children, who are already overworked uh, and due a pay raise, are seeing the necessary investment into education to ensure children with autism do get the support they deserve in a sustainable way. To do that, we must address the underspend in education. And without the extra support, the extra funding, the extra classroom assistance, the whole provision of extra training may be futile because under pressure teachers and assistants may not have the time nor space to put the whole thing into practice. Finally, and importantly, Mr. Speaker, we have to be careful that the provision of mandatory training uh, uh, for autism in mainstream schools is not used as an excuse to close or shut down special needs schools. Uh, in 2018, I led a campaign alongside teachers, classroom assistants, trade unions, uh, parents and pupils uh, of special needs schools in Belfast against the closure of special needs schools. And I have no doubt uh, if plans emerge again to try to shut down or amalgamate special needs schools, uh, that a similar campaign with all the ferocity that existed before will be back on the streets uh, of our city in Belfast. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you, members. This is the resumption of the debate that was uh, suspended for question time. The next person that I had on my list was the Minister for Education. I call the Minister for Education, Mr Peter Weir. Thank you, Mr Deputy Principal Speaker. And first of all, I would start at the outset of um, concluding this debate and thanking all the members for their valuable contributions today. It is clear, and I would pay tribute as others have, to the various groups that have been involved with autism. And I think that uh, in terms of the contributions that we've had today, it has benefited from the fact, shows perhaps many the merits of all party groups, that we've had so many speakers who have spoken from the background of having, if you like, gone through the evidence through the all party groups. 
It can be, obviously, uh, autism can be both quite an emotive subject and a very significant subject, particularly for those families um, you know, of, of children with autism. And it is clear that what we have seen today is a considerable consensus across the chamber on this issue. Um, the two amendments themselves, uh, if I maybe start there, have perhaps nuances of difference between them, but I think the general direction of travel uh, is the same with both. To that extent, therefore, I am happy to indicate perhaps at the start of, of this um, summing up that uh, I am happy to support either or both amendments and indeed the main motion itself. I will not be seeking in any way to divide the House on, uh, in terms of the nuances of difference between the two. The significance, I think, as, as some speakers have highlighted, um, has been, I think, a, a welcome development in recent years, but it has then created a need, uh, particularly for more awareness and more training, has been the, the growth in recognition and diagnosis of autism. Uh, ten years ago, the figures um, of those who have been diagnosed with autism were around about 1.2 per cent. Today, it is at 3.3 per cent. Um, as a number of speakers have indicated, it's the equivalent of about one for every classroom. That has been because I think there's been a growing recognition uh, of autism. I, I don't believe it's particularly because there's been a particular change in any form of uh, the condition. It has actually been that for many pupils who in previous years went undiagnosed, there's a much greater opportunity for that to be, to be picked up. Now, as we look in terms of the issues of um, the role of educational professionals, you know, they're not qualified to make uh, or are they responsible for the diagnosis of any child's medical issue. But what is important is that they're informed by the child's experience, their views, their strengths and need, and their role, I suppose, is to identify the impact on the, ch uh, the child's learning experience and participation within an inclusive educational system. Then, using those knowledge and skills, they can adapt their practice to enable every child to fulfil their potential. We should always remember that every child is an individual and that their needs uh, are always slightly different. And provision of support for special education is based upon those individual needs and specific uh, supports required to meet the needs of the child. And those with special educational needs quite often have more than one type of uh, need or difficulty, and therefore interventions are tailored to meet the specific needs of the individual child. For autism, special educational needs may include speech, uh, language, communication, social interaction, behaviour, emotional and wellbeing challenges. And there is a direct responsibility on the education authority to ensure that training that they provide is equitable and balanced across a wide range of special educational needs. Now, I want to highlight, I suppose, three areas where there is pre-existing training. Um, first of all, there is the Autism uh, Advisory and Intervention Service that is provided uh, by EA, which provides a, a wide range of autistic, uh, autism spectrum disorder training on request. And through that intervention, uh, last year, the figures we have is 4,000 uh, 4,023 teachers and school staff assess, access training from that. Now, I would say, and I think a number of members have made this clear in this debate, and it's been highlighted by the unions, uh, that is a good service. Is it in and of itself adequate? No, I don't believe it is. And it's been highlighted, I think, uh, by particularly reference from the Ulster Teachers Union. I think that has been something which has been identified by the EA itself. And uh, they've identified the need for a more strategic development of regional training. So, even from the EA, I think they've accepted that what is there is not, is not sufficient. Uh, mention has also been made, which is found, funded jointly uh, by my department and indeed the Department of Education and Skills in the Republic of Ireland, is the Middletown Centre for Autism. And while I know a number of members have visited the Middletown Centre, I would certainly encourage them uh, to do so. It operates as a second tier service um, to the EA to augment their autism training programme. It has built a reputation for excellence in the quality of its services, as confirmed I suppose, by independent joint inspections both in 2012 and 2016. Middletown provides a comprehensive range of online training and advisory services for educational professionals, for parents, children and other allied health professionals, effectively a one-stop shop to support children with autism in both their education setting and also, as I think was mentioned by a number of speakers, that we take a holistic approach. It's the support that's available at, at home is also critical. It also provides. Uh, yes, I'll give one. Uh, just, um, I know that you've mentioned there are other places. Would you recognise 
through that the informal education sector, in other words, the youth services, can also provide an invaluable resource to be able to help with the socialisation of young people with autism, and that there are some excellent examples out there currently, and that maybe as part of today's debate you could bring back into the department maybe how some work within youth services could be strengthened going forward as well. I think uh, while we want to be in a situation that we provide the best of services, that will quite often be a cocktail of measures. It's not simply a, a one-off. Uh, and the members, right, and I know a number of the, the youth service providers have, have received, for instance, excellent inspection reports, and particularly when dealing with uh, the issues around autism. Uh, so I would certainly acknowledge that. Can I also say, just turning back briefly to, to Middletown, um, it provides a fully integrated suite of services, including cohesive uh, transdisciplinary learning support and assessment service combined with research and training alongside opportunities for family support and during the, the latest figures in terms of the 12 years of its inter, uh, interventions it's delivered training to over 33,000 uh, professionals. Now many educational professionals access the training through this and they're free to access. Provision of tailored uh, special educational needs training specific to need coupled with school-based uh, support, an incremental approach to service delivery has been the current model, and it's to ensure that knowledge and understanding gained from any training is fully integrated. Training programmes are largely focused on upskilling educational professionals and enhancing capacity of educational institutions to support children with autism um, in their education, setting and in, in the home, and also providing parents and support. One of the outcomes arising from the capacity building project established in response to the 2017 Northern Ireland Audit Office Special Educational Needs Report is that special educational needs training, including autism, for teachers and those studying is a key focus of the Learning Leaders Oversight Group, which is chaired by my department and again involves a range of, of stakeholders. And the purpose of this is to provide uh, strategic direction in the design and development. So, that oversight group uh, was established in March of 2017 following publication of the report. Now, there are, I have to say, many special needs, uh, special educational needs within our schools. And it's important, therefore, uh, that we get sort of balance, but also that we get that level of, of focus, particularly on, on autism. We've seen a rising number of children with SEN again uh, through identification, which has resulted and there has been mention made of the, the overall uh, cost of around about 280 million is the latest assessment in terms of the educational budget. And obviously, there will be a need to ensure that what we do is we get the best possible delivery for, for our young people and the best possible value for our money. And so, therefore, we have to uh, slightly caveat this on the basis of what resources are available. The one thing I can assure, I know Mr. Durkin uh, raised the, the issue about the Western Trust. Um, my department, in terms of any spend, on children, particularly in terms of resources, will not be handing back any money. We will often be going to the finance minister looking for more, but there will not be any underspend to the Department of Education. But despite the pressures that are there, I think we can think imaginatively. We are looking at uh, in terms of where we are uh, with this. And indeed, through the capacity building group, um, you know, it does provide perhaps a, some degree of template, which can also actually we need to look holistically at both uh, CPD and indeed uh, through initial teacher education. It is clear, I think, that, uh, that we need to see a step change in terms of what we provide uh, for special educational needs. And therefore, uh, in the spring, I hope to launch uh, the framework, indeed consultation on the framework for special educational needs. And that will provide a coordinated uh, approach to both autism and indeed other special educational needs. It's also the case that the second report, and I know there's been criticism as well of, of all these things are, are multi-agency, multi-department in their nature, and there's been some criticism of also of some other departments. Um, the second progress report on the current autism strategy, uh, which is by the Department of Health in conjunction with the departments, I think is due also to launch soon. The big issue, I suppose, ultimately is, is how do we move on from here? Mention has been made particularly of initial teacher education. And I think it is a well-made point that if we are to embed what is there, uh, that start at the starting point of ensuring that teachers coming out in the first place do so with that, that level of knowledge. Now, 
uh, I should put a little bit of a caveat in terms of initial teacher education that uh, ultimately the, uh, the cost of initial teacher education is paid by the Department of the Economy. So I suppose I can't make a pledge which actually then spends somebody else's money. And curriculum um, is one that, that is controlled by the uh, higher in education institutions themselves. But whereas there has been some level of availability of training uh, in terms of uh, autism, I think there is a concern that, that the depth of that is not being sufficient. So therefore we need to move to a situation where it's embedded within initial teacher education and also then in the wider context uh, that, uh, that we can ensure that there is that, that rollout of mandatory training. As indicated... Sorry, yes, I'll, I'll go away. Thank you, the Minister, for the intervention there. Welcome him to his place in the dispatch box and wish him well as he carries on the work he started before the institutions were suspended. Minister, there had been talk of a new uh, ASD behaviour unit uh, to be located in North Belfast. That wasn't able to pro be progressed because of the collapse of the institutions. Could I ask the Minister, having spoken to local principals and teachers, could I ask the Minister to look at this as one of his priorities as he goes forward? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to give that assurance that we'll take a look at that. We, we need to make sure that we have the right network of facilities that, that are there. It is important that all our teachers, and particularly both in special and mainstream schools, and there's no hidden agenda to look to abolish uh, any form of special schools. It's about getting that, that degree of balance. Have to be as always highly skilled in supporting pupils with autism to succeed in schools. And it's important also, therefore, that our educational professions are appropriately skilled. It is clear that what we've been doing up until now, while it has made a valuable contribution, is falling short of the mark. And we need to embed that level of knowledge um, within our professionals. There are, I think, imaginative solutions which uh, the proposal of motion and others have, have come up with. Uh, we can see, for example, as part of the SEM framework, there will be an opportunity uh, as we move ahead to embed, I think, within the so-called Baker days, uh, some degree of provision then and the recommendation that they should use those particularly for SEM training. And I think that, that can provide a level of focus on, on autism as well. From that point of view, I think there's a, a unity of spirit here um, I think the issue, therefore, is not a, uh, the issue of whether, it's a question of how we do this. And uh, from that point of view, I'm not doctrinaire as to precisely the, uh, how we reach that end point. But it is clear that given the growing needs that we have in terms of uh, the greatly increased level of identification of, of autism, and therefore the prevalence in both mainstream and specialised schools, that we do need to deliver better. Uh, and I'll be happy to work with, with others to ensure that uh, there is that access to adequate, appropriate training programmes that are available throughout, both in terms of initial teacher education uh, and indeed in terms of continuing professional development. I think that has to also borrow very heavily from the experience both of parents and the teachers on the ground. Uh, sometimes we can almost, uh, there is a tendency from the Assembly or ministers to almost dictate from above. I, th I think it's important if we're going to have something that's fit for purpose that learns from the experience, particularly of families as, they, as, they, as they've experienced it, and what works uh, directly for teachers. Uh, that is the commitment I give. We will ensure then that we move towards that system, which means therefore that the proper provision is made, proper awareness and recognition and proper training are put in place uh, in terms of autism. And I welcome the rest of the debate. Mr Deputy Speaker. Thank you very much, Minister. I call upon Chris Little to wind on Amendment No. 2. Principal Deputy Speaker. No. No problem. <laughs> Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, it's a privilege for me to respond to this uh, motion today. Uh, and in so doing, um, to begin with, uh, I'd like to read into the record uh, contribution that I've received from uh, a parent of a, a child with autism uh, in, in relation to the debate. Um, it, it reads, Dear Chris, please keep pushing for mandatory autism training for teachers. My son was diagnosed with autism in June of P6, and a number of his teachers were unable to recognise indicators earlier. I don't think they believed my concerns because he is high-functioning. He was constantly punished for behaviour beyond his control. His confidence plummeted. He didn't want to go to school. His learning was affected. It was a dreadful year that could have been easier if people were trained, equipped and supported to respond. 
please keep pushing so another family doesn't have to suffer the way we did. We had both to adjust to autism at home and fight for our son at school. Because of his autism and the pattern-based way in which he learns, if he didn't know an answer on his post-primary transfer academic selection papers, he couldn't move on to the next because a pattern had been broken. He had to withdraw from the academic selection process for his mental health and his choices were instantly reduced. Our son is bright and been diagnosed as high functioning, but that doesn't matter as academic selection processes appear to make no allowance for a child who thinks differently. Their minds aren't standardised, but they are meant to fit into standardised tests. They can't, so they are rejected and they have no choice. It is a disgrace. I torture myself by wondering would it have been different if staff had autism training, understanding and support. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, for the opportunity to ensure that contribution from a, a parent of a child with autism has been heard today. The motion proposed by Pam Cameron, MLA, the chairperson of the all-party group on autism, gives this Assembly the opportunity to recognise the unacceptable challenges and the breach of rights that children and families living with autism in Northern Ireland face. To recognise that many children and families living with autism in Northern Ireland feel unsupported and indeed failed by our education, statementing and health systems. To recognise the failure to fully implement the Autism Act and Autism Strategy. To recognise the need to train and resource our valued teaching staff to identify and respond to the additional needs of many pupils in our schools. And, Principal Deputy Speaker, that's an opportunity that has been taken by MLAs here today. They have identified the centrality of autism teacher training and support to early intervention. They have recognised that the timeline for action has been lengthy and indeed that delivery is needed now. And that in the absence of this provision, not only educational attainment but mental health of children and finances of families are affected. They have also recognised that excellent resources do exist in the likes of Middletown Autism Centre, but that investment and mandated access is needed. Principal Deputy Speaker, the motion proposed by Pam Cameron, MLA, and amended by Rachel Woods, MLA, and I gives this Assembly the opportunity to support the widespread campaign calling on the Minister for Education to introduce mandatory autism training for all trainee teachers and teaching staff. I ask members to support the motion and amendment and call on all ministers with responsibility for implementing the Autism Act and strategy commitments to attend and brief the all-party assembly group on autism as to how they will deliver on these commitments, but importantly, starting with the training and resourcing needed by our teachers to deliver early intervention and educational opportunity for children with autism and additional needs in our community. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now, before I call the next speaker, I would remind the House that as this is Catherine Kelly's first opportunity to speak as a private member, it is the convention in this House that a maiden speech is made without interruption. I call Ms Kelly. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. The number of children diagnosed with autism has risen by 20% within the last 10 years here. Boys are four, more, four times more likely than girls to be diagnosed. And even more alarmingly is the rate of autism within more deprived communities. In these areas, the rate of autism is 58% higher than the average. Of course, resources should reflect the higher prevalence of need in more deprived communities and amongst boys. But mandatory autism training for all teachers and classroom assistants is a basic first step. Autism is a developmental issue and teachers are in the business of developing children's potential. From personal experience having worked in Neeskal Nagran in Oma, I must say that helping children to fulfil their potential is very, very rewarding. And I would like to take a moment to recognise the amazing work carried out in my own constituency of West Tyrone by teachers and others. Organisations like the National Autistic Society West Branch in Oma, who have been working for many years with children with autism and also their families. West Tyrone has a high proportion of children and young people, 
many living in lower income families, but we do very well in education. Barriers can be overcome, potential can be developed, our schools and teachers need proper support. We wouldn't expect a plumber or an electrician to do a proper job without the right set of, set of tools. Give our teachers the right set of tools. Tools that allow them to understand the specific needs of children and young people with autism. In addition, let's do something we often fail to do. Listen to the children and young people themselves. I would ask all members to support Amendment 1 today and to recognise the need for compulsory training for, for those in teacher training colleges and undertaking a PGCE. We need to ensure a proper foundation of support and education for our children, young people, teachers and classroom assistants. I would like to thank all those who have made a contribution to the debate this afternoon. Before I call the next speaker, can I congratulate, be the first to congratulate the member on making her maiden speech. It's sometimes intimidating to stand up in here and the first time to do it, so congratulations to you. I call Mr William Humphrey to wind up the debate on the motion. Deputy Speaker, and can I start by congratulating you on the, your elevation to the position of Principal Deputy Speaker of this House and wish you well in that new role. Um, can I thank my colleague and the member for South Antrim, uh, Pam Brown, for successfully securing this debate and indeed for the agreement that she has managed to achieve across this House. It doesn't always happen uh, around this issue, which of course is hugely important to members uh, within our constituencies. In Northern Ireland, 62 per cent, uh, there's been a 62 per cent increase in the school age of children diagnosed with autism in the last five years. The Department of Health research reveals that autism is prevalent in the classroom now, and as a member, other members have said, at least one child in each classroom. So therefore, Minister, the programme for government needs to, be, to deal with the issues that are faced and there needs to be real adjustments for support for autistic children and, more importantly, for their teachers to allow them to carry that out. If teachers are trained and given the skills and if the strategies are implemented, children will achieve their full potential. No child with autism should miss out on a full and supportive education. This uh, would be hugely, hugely impactful in our classroom, on our society and, most importantly, on each individual child impacted. The fact that one third of our children may be uh, in a reduced timetable is totally unacceptable. 78 per cent of those children are placed in main mainstream education. And it is my view that all teaching staff in Northern Ireland should, over a period of time, be trained. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, early intervention is more effective, it's more cost effective, and it is also better for the, everyone involved in this issue. As with mental health, suicide and general well-being mentally, a joined-up approach is required by government across departments and with local government and government agencies. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the principals, the teachers, the classroom assistants who work in all of our schools across Northern Ireland day and daily around this issue. I have been dealing with a couple of cases recently in my office where teachers are absolutely stressed to the max around this issue. And principals really don't know where to turn. We need to give clarity and certainty and the skills to these teachers to allow them to carry out these roles and functions, to provide the education that these young people need, and to give them the classroom environment to allow not just them as an individual, but their peers in the classroom to have an education that will make a change, a positive change in their lives. Formalised training is needed. We need to also provide protection for teachers, for classroom assistants. And of course, this will positively enhance, as I've said, young people's education. Minister, equity must be brought to the classroom in terms of training and for those education professionals within the classroom. Ulster school children must have the same parity as those across the United Kingdom. I want to take this opportunity to pay tribute to some people who I know have been making a huge contribution uh, around this issue, not just in the classroom but in the community. And like Mr Little, I want to read into the record uh, a lady in my constituency, Ashley Spence, who established Snowflakes, 
a group that is working with young people from across Greater Belfast and indeed outside the city boundaries now. It's a, it's a group of parents who have come together to form a group who are working with young people in the a ASD spectrum. They have done fantastic work. But she has written to me knowing this debate was coming up today and she has asked me to make a number of points. Number one, how will the training be delivered and by who? She makes the point it would be her opinion it should be no less than the training provided to parents once diagnosis is confirmed. These initial classes are delivered by various specialists, occupational therapists, speech and language therapists, etc. They cover the reasoning behind understanding and strategies to identify and manage behaviours. They are delivered on three or four sessions. A one-day PowerPoint presentation is not going to be used to any teachers or classroom assistants. They need true understanding. I think we would all agree with that. She also makes the point, how will success be measured? What impact will the, having the training teaching staff on allocation of additional classroom assistance and support for children within mainstream schooling? And will there be extra resource for schools to implement strategies when they are learned via this training? If a teacher has the training and learns of a resource and a help, help with the child in the class, for example, visual timetable or scheduling board, wobble cushions, will there be a uh, fund for available for teachers to purchase or obtain such items? All of this is hugely important. Extra resource is needed. And therefore, I think it's important that we all take these issues on board. I also want to pay tribute to this lady because she's also involved in my Scout District and to declare an interest as the President of North Wales Belfast Scout Council. We have a Scout group in our district that is purely specific for young children who are ASD, uh, uh, have the ASD condition. This young lady is working with that group. She is doing valuable work. We need to support these people in the classrooms. We really need, sorry. need to support those in the community who are working hard. I have great pleasure in, in, in supporting the motion. Not my afternoon. It's all right. Um, before I put the question on Amendment Number One, I would remind members that if it is made, I will not put the question on Amendment Number Two. The question is that Amendment Number One, standing in the names of Miss Rachel Woods and Mr. Chris Little, be made. All those in favour, say aye. Aye. The contrary, if any. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The question is that the motion as amended be agreed. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary if any. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. If members would like to take their ease while there is a change just at the top table.